when I was at NASA, a lot of people focused on finding other planets around other star systems. And it is absolutely and abundantly clear this is the nicest planet we've ever found. I mean, not by a little way, by a really long way, right? Now we have found some planets that seem to be close to or in the habitable zone. That's the zone for a planet to be where it has liquid water in terms of its distance from its star. So there's potential for life. We haven't discovered any yet. Um, I think it, it seems likely that we'll find it eventually. But until and unless we do, and even when we do, it's definitely rare. We could be the only ones. The, this life is incredibly rare. Welcome to the Regeneration Will Be Funded. My name is Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're exploring the intersections of regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. Created with Ma Earth, you can find all of our conversations and more at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Today's guest is Will Marshall, co-founder and CEO of Planet Labs. Will is highly intelligent and cogent. I've had multiple people tell me this is their favorite conversation that we've recorded so far. In this discussion, Will offers his perspective on the state of the planet, why he believes that we have our environmental priorities wrong, what he thinks should be the order of operations, summarizing three key priorities for addressing our ecological crisis. And despite the dire state of affairs, Will thinks that transformational change is possible in as little as one year and offers a few other reasons to be hopeful as well. We go into how satellites can play an influential role in catalyzing change and a specific ingredient that will be critical for this innovation. I ask Will, where does Web3 fit into all of this? And he also shares what he believes is a higher leverage point than technology. I appreciate Will for sitting down to have this conversation. It was recorded at the Eco Weaving Gathering in May, 2023. Let's dive in, Will Marshall. We're here with Will Marshall. Will is the co-founder and CEO of Planet. Thanks for being here, Will. Hey, no worries. Uh, let's start with Planet. What is Planet? What What do you do? Okay, we'll start from the top then. Um, Planet, uh, we have built satellites that are uh, about a couple of hundred in orbit now that image the whole Earth every day, tracking changes. Fundamentally, it's about uh, you can't manage things unless you measure them. Mm. So we are, uh, you know, as 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 Buckminster Fuller would say, on Spaceship Earth. Uh, it's a spacecraft with 8 billion or so astronauts on board and actually lots more if you count the other species. Um, we're all hurtling around the sun and you have to take care of this spaceship. And you can't take care of a spaceship if you don't have data on it on a fast enough timescale. Or more practically put, for example, if you're trying to track and stop deforestation in the Amazon, you need uh, the data about where the felling is taking place that's illegal on a day's time or week's time scales, because that's mm. the time scale on which it happens, not months or years. If you wake up at the end of the year and there's a report telling you where the trees were going down, that's a bit too late. You know now know where it's happened, mm. but you can't do anything about it. So data inside the decision-making loop of human operations so that we can take care of spaceship Earth. And that ranges from yeah, disaster response through to agriculture, through to um, peace and security, through to um, uh, the kind of sustainability things uh, that we do day to day. And so um, information inside the human decision making loop for making smarter decisions. Mm, great. And maybe just to give people a sense of planet if they're not familiar. So now your public benefit company, mm -hmm. um, roughly like size and scope of the operation. Yeah. Um, well, we started the company about 10 years ago uh, as a spin out of NASA um, that where Viewers of us have been pioneering small satellite technology. Hmm. I just went back there the other day. It was really fun uh, going on our old haunt. And uh, but basically, we had launched some phones into space, and they had worked. And we were like, they're six orders of magnitude lower cost than the, hmm. the traditional billion-dollar satellites that NASA put up. And 
we're like, okay, could we do more of those more frequently? Um, anyway, um, long story short, at this stage, um, we're, it's, we left with seven people, now we're about a thousand, um, and did a couple of hundred million in revenue last year, growing quite fast, uh, just to give you a rough sense, let's go. Yeah. Mm. And as you say, we went public uh, a year and a half ago as a public benefit corporation, which essentially makes the fiduciary duties of the directors to be uh, broader based, not just focused on shareholder value, although that's one thing that they get to look out for, but also the mission of the company. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, in our case, that's basically using space to help life on earth. Mm -hmm. And so they really have to think about that. That's their fiduciary obligations as director of planet. Um, and that's important, right? We've got to align our businesses and corporations around the world with the interests of the planet. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that's why we went that way new form of corporation only uh, 10 or so organizations have gone that right. way at the time we went public i don't know what the count is now um but i think it's an important advance on 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 uh, legal uh, structures for companies yeah yeah 100 percent agree so as someone who looks at the earth for a living um, and studies the state of affairs. Like, what is what is the going ecological <laughs> state of our planet right now? Well, uh, from ten thousand feet, or <laughs> in our case, five hundred kilometers, um, it's a bit of a mess. I mean, it's a beautiful planet. But that's the first thing you notice. The second thing you notice is it's changing all the time. Mm. Um, but if you really dive into the details, yeah, it really does get unfortunate very quickly. Uh, mainly, human impact on precious ecosystems. Uh, so, uh, but it, the beauty never ceases to amaze me. We, we download about 4 million images a day, each about 47 megapixels. So a huge amount of imagery. So obviously I don't look at it all, but we have various channels look, segmenting the imagery. And mm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's like we've, We've spent, and um, when I was at NASA, a lot of people focused on finding other planets around other star systems. And it is absolutely and abundantly clear this is the nicest planet we've ever found. I mean, not by a little way, mm. by a really long way, right? Now we have found some planets that seem to be close to or in the habitable zone. That's the zone of a planet to be where it has liquid water in terms of its distance from its star. So there's potential for life. We haven't discovered any yet. Um, I think it, it seems likely that we'll find it eventually, but until and unless we do, and even when we do, it's definitely rare. We could be the only ones. The, this life is incredibly rare. I often think, I do the thought experiment, like if you were an AI and you woke up on the planet, and mm -hmm. you might be going through that episode in the coming uh, years, what would you do? Uh, what would you think is your purpose in life? What, mm -hmm. you know, if you were to be thinking about your goal function on your own, what would you be? And the first thing you probably go is look out in the universe and go, wow, if you would summarize all of human knowledge on Wikipedia, looking up and looking down, the earth is extremely unusual. It's a vast universe, mostly rocks and dead matter, gases in between in interstellar distances, uh, between galaxies and between stars, and almost none of it is life. And I'm not saying it's 99.999% rocks. You'd be having nines through most of the rest of this interview <laughs> before you get to the, you know, uh, uh, mm. anything lifelike. Mm. So it's mostly rocks and dust by ridiculous abundance. Um, even if you just measure the earth, it's 99.999999% uh, rocks and uh, mm. uh, uh, dead matter. Life matter is extraordinarily unusual, right? Um, no matter what. And that gives an extra... Um, motivation, I think, and impetus to take mm. seriously the um, our keystone species role on this planet in helping to steward it. Mm. And and so tell tell us more about the the state of the planet in terms of what do you see as the the main challenges and areas for concern. Well, I think the best uh, summary of the challenges really is focused on the eco side. Um, so. I think a lot of people are very aware of the environment challenge generally mm -hmm. and loosely aware that it sort of splits into the climate piece and the biodiversity piece. But if I drill down a little bit on that, um, um, I think it's important to understand the state of affairs. Um, the biodiversity is 
uh, really at a huge pressure point right now. Um, we really the we have lost about seventy percent of life in populations terms mm -hmm. over the last forty years. So since we've been accurately measuring it in a sense. Um, the IPBES did the study. This is the UN group that really studies the biodiversity on the planet. And, and they looked at populations of different species across amphibians and birds and uh, mammals and plants. And, and, and on average, we're seeing about a 70% decline in numbers over the last uh, 40 years, mm -hmm. which is gobsmacking, right? It's about 82% of mammals are gone. So deer and you know your your wild boar or your um, elephants and giraffe or whatever. Eighty two percent of those gone by numbers. So mm -hmm. you know most of them. Um, two thirds of the birds. Seventy five percent of fish in freshwater lakes and rivers. Um, most of the insects. About seventy percent of the insects. Um, over half the world's forests. Over half the world's coral reefs. Um, that's already happened. Now, actually, the biodiversity piece, like the number of species, we haven't knocked off too many yet. We, we're, we're killing them at a ridiculous, the extinction rate had gone up about 100x to 1,000x over the pre-human or the pre-industrial revolution rate of change of species. So we can look back at the fossil record and see how quickly they were going extinct. We've made 100x to 1,000x change in the rate of extinction. So we're definitely massively changing it. But actually, by numbers, you know, we've got millions of species and the number of species that have actually gone extinct that we know of so far, although there's a lot of gaps, is pretty small. We're threatening about 25% of species, which sucks. I mean, and the, in the amphibian world, it's like more like 90% and, mm -hmm. and in others, it's much less. Um, but on, on the aggregate, 25%. Mm -hmm. But luckily, we haven't got to the point where we've really culled. In, so we've got members of most species, we've declined their populations radically. So it's really an ecocide. That's mm -hmm. the right word for it. Franz Timmermans, the EU commissioner, calls it there. And I think it's great that he, because it's not just about biodiversity loss, not about the diversity. It's also about the num population, because once you get below a certain population threshold, you worry about it really becoming into mass extinction, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a fun paper that looked at forest degradation. As you take out trees randomly um, from a forest, at what point, it, it sort of, there's, there's a curve of how much biodiversity it has and it just disappears mm -hmm. at, at a certain knee in the curve because at some point the fragments get too far apart and then the, then the, the biology can't get between them. Why do you feel biodiversity is so important? Well, um, f there's many reasons to think about it, but the most important is for the value it, it, um, that it has intrinsically. Um, so how the UN talks about it in all these formal international meetings is what they call MBS, nature-based services, which I think is super important um, and we should value that. And mm. I'll come to that in a second. Mm. But intrinsically, per my point about life in the universe, these things should be valuable to us mm. because we value life and the fantastic diversity that it provides. And then secondly, mm. um, roughly half of the economy or more is dependent on it. We can't get clean water without nature. Nature mm. does all of our cleaning services. It cleans the air. It gives us the oxygen. It, it basically, without nature, we are screwed. I mean, we might think of ourselves as a technological organization, a society, but we are very early on that journey. And mm -hmm. right now, the vast majority of our materials and cleaning and resources are provisioned by nature. Get rid of that at your peril we are systematically reducing the numbers and at some point one worries that it jumps over and you lose the mm -hmm. species diversity on mass so this eco side is the main problem in the environment space there's, there's also the climate problem ecosystem uh, e the eco side is being driven by a number of factors the climate change is not the main one the main one is human encroachment onto into habitat that's deforestation um and that's pr principally caused caused by um, changing forests into agricultural lands for cattle and palm oil and things like this. So mm. when you buy palm oil or beef, you are mo in most cases, especially when you buy it in the West, you're driving deforestation in the Amazon. Mm. And then um, it's overfishing in the oceans um, and dredging and things like that that just culls life there. Mm. 
as opposed to warming, which then could threaten those species, that's considered the third factor. Um, but it's quite a distant third at the present time. If we keep on our rate of warming the climate, that might become a dominant factor in the future. But we're already causing the eco side even without climate change, right. is my main point. The climate change doesn't matter per se. We only care about climate change in as much as it hurts us and the rest of life. Mm -hmm. And that's not the driving factor right now. And so I think human, humanity has got that priority a little bit the wrong way around. I'm not saying don't focus on climate. Mm -hmm. I am saying that we should focus more on the eco side piece. So rather than our leverage point being reduced carbon emissions, what you're saying is we'll first stop habitat destruction. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you fix that, you fix most of climate and not vice versa. Mm -hmm. Roughly speaking, you know, the, 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 the forests of the lungs of our planet and and same with the oceans, with the seagrass and the plankton, and mm. that's pulling down uh, the CO2. Um, and yeah, so how do you feel about this big mega trend towards electrification? Yeah, so that's, that's, that is important, but I would say it's secondary to the lungs mm. of the planet. So even if you turned off all the coal power plants and turn them into solar panels or, and wind farms mm. tomorrow, mm -hmm. That didn't stop the fact that we we're wiping out the forests, right? And so that's when stop we have the to do a lot of mining to support that. Absolutely, and sometimes mm -hmm. these comes in. There was a great documentary recently about Tesla and the batteries and where that's causing mm -hmm. deforestation. It's not clear what the net net is there, right? When again, those forests natively are sucking down CO two, right? Uh, um, the reason the the asymmetry is that if you if you keep nature, uh, if you just let those forests grow back, mm -hmm. you suck down more CO two. Whereas if you turn all the coal power plants into renewables, you, you don't automatically stop the destruction of the forest. Right. So if you save nature in a way, you get climate saved for free or a lot of the way for right. free. Right. If you solve climate, you don't get nature for free. And so this is why. And then the nat there was a nature article recently showing that um, we're spending about 100 to 1 mm -hmm. on climate versus conservation. Yeah. So, so wow. not only are we not considering the most important, we're, we're funding it ridiculously little, right. which well, is why you can also have big impact with small dollars in totally. conservation. Conservation has become like not sexy. No. You know, like no. I, I find in the philanthropic context, it's like, yeah, that's like the previous generation, you know, and yeah. I'm like, well, it's actually more important than ever. More important than ever. And when people are striving to do CO2 ca carbon capture, Mm. Um, the best technology is nature. Right. I mean, the tree, it plants itself. You don't even have to right. do anything. But it's know? not permanent. Like, well, no. I, well, yeah. this is you know the, we can get to those debates, but it's like yeah, I, yes. Uh, uh, it, I I yeah, I think we've got our priorities stacked wrong. So environment is the right word. Mm. Climate is a part of it. Mm. Ecocide is the more important word mm. <laughs> that we should be focusing upon. What about the water cycle? Yeah, I think that's part of it, right? Mm. Um, that's part of it. And, you know, look, uh, we're going to go through a very tricky time coming up because mm. of the extreme weather that's coming about from climate that's making exacerbating things, um, as well as that coupled with agriculture, which we get to. But, but look, um, yeah, I think that conservation is where it's at. It sounds mm. like old school, but... Um, uh, but we have some technologies that can speed up this transition. Uh, but I think we first need to recognize as a society that that's got to be priority one, mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that gives us a bit of a, and I guess one more question about the problem. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk of, of tipping points mm -hmm. and kind of tipping points that are now starting to cascade. Yeah. How do you think about that? I don't know enough about it. I, mm -hmm. I think it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. We don't really know. We've worried about that stuff in the past and blown through things. And then people are going, oh, well, you said it was going to be a tipping point. And there wasn't. Mm. I worry a lot um, about mm. it. Um, I don't know how you get a handle on it. I read Nature magazine incessantly. And almost every week there's an article showing a new nonlinearity we hadn't understood before, coupling mm. this and that. Um, um, there was a, one I read literally uh, yesterday, which was about... Uh, whether um, sea lanes, which go about emissions and emissions in general, cause more clouds, and does that overall net negatively or positively affect? And we assumed it would be net positively affect because it it created more clouds that bounce more light off. Mm. 
Um, but there's many, and, and it turns out that it was, it was going the other way. And until we had studied it properly for all sorts of technical reasons, we didn't know it was that way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everyone knows about the, you know, if you melt water, it becomes less reflective, which then melts more water, which then becomes less reflective. And that's a bad thing. Right. right? But there's lots of other nonlinearities like that. Right. And we barely begun, but I would say on the whole, we're discovering more and more that going the other way direction, yeah. that the Amazon, was at one point, every time we pumped more CO2, it was like, give me that stuff. <laughs> and it was sucking it down. And then it got to a point with temperature rises mm. where it's just not doing that anymore. Mm. And now it's becoming net negative as you know, so mm. uh, at some level, life was compensating and absorbing a lot of the CO2 we were yeah. putting up. At, yeah. Same um, with the oceans. Same with the oceans. And now it looks like it's reversing. Very right. dangerous. Right. We don't know what we're doing. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I like and appreciate that you have this this very rigorous academic and scientific understanding, but then you're leading with humility and honoring like the, the natural state of ecosystems is the North Star. I think so. I mean, you know, right here, we're on a, um, a, a nature preserve that is about a thousand hectares that we're trying to um, uh, rewild. Um, mainly so that we can get a sort of hands-on understanding of what that means because mm. we help with satellite data these far-flung locations i don't know what it means on the ground i wanted to really understand and mm. you know get a sense for that yeah. and it's hard work and it takes many years mm. and and it's complicated because oh there's this invasive and that doesn't come over here and how do you yeah. get rid of it and how do you rewilding is is hard so it's not just about mm. the data and the tools but yeah. understanding that can help us to build better tools that are then fit for the purpose to totally. help people yeah okay so my, my experience of you is that you have this this high degree of like a a, a positive urgency yeah that's grounded in this kind of sense of like guys this is really important and we yeah. need to act you know and you're very solutions focused so maybe we'd love to shift from okay yeah that's the problem now shit's we, dire yeah. what do we yeah. do yeah absolutely well yeah i definitely am an optimist at heart and especially um um two things one is when we get out of the way nature bounces back so fast. We mm -hmm. even saw that lightly during COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a great Gary Larson cartoon that was 2019. All the animals in behind bars um, in the zoo and the humans mm -hmm. walking past, going, ah. and then then in 2020, all the humans behind the bars of their own houses and the animals taking back the streets and mm -hmm. waving at them from the other side. You know, so to speak. <laughs> and the speed at which that happened in a few right. places was astonishing. Right. Right. And I was I was scuba diving in the Marshall Islands, which are my islands, so I mm. had permission to <laughs> scuba dive there. And um, they had been nuked by the US <laughs> in the 60s. Mm -hmm. They used the Marshall Islands as nuclear weapon target practice, mm. displacing all the people, terrible destruction of yeah. the life is back and you can't bloody believe that it was ever nuked, you know? Wow. So this, we, the amazing thing, give, nature this but you don't need to do much more than give her mm. back the space mm. she'll bounce back the other thing that um gives me hope is technology mm. i'm not a techno utopianist i don't believe technology solves all problems but we've got some impressive tools to bring to bear on these challenges now right. from satellite data obviously a passion of mine to drones to sensors on the ground which all of which can help us to understand what we're doing and doing this we can't manage it if we don't measure it thing mm powerful AI to apply to that to enable us to understand and get to, get to grips with all, all that means and especially to democratize that in a way that's not just NOAA with teams of mm. scientists that can understand climate models mm. with PhDs by the thousand, but rather individuals in NGOs or citizen scientists or whatever can get mm. to grips with how to help because AI democratizes the access to that. Um, and then, as we're seeing already with ChatGPT in a way, right. and then Finally, all the uh, smart contracts and other things of Web3 technologies that can glue it all together in a way that actually enables us to avoid the middleman in a mm. way and go straight from a big corporation like Microsoft that wants to buy carbon credits to the, to the, per, the indigenous people in Bolivia that are stewarding some part of their forest mm. and can be paid for the carbon credits to 
and to save their forests, mm. you know? Um, so I, I want to dive into all of those yeah. pieces because you're so sophisticated in your understanding of the tech. But maybe before we get there, like, how yeah. would you frame the, if you were, you know, emperor of Earth and you're like, okay, we have yeah. to, you know, organize and address this ecological emergency. Yeah. What would be the rough order of operations? Where would you focus? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm CEO of Planet. I mean, if you just but the Planet. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> take some hubris out of me. Uh, anyway, uh, um, I think that it's actually simpler than people think, at least to frame up. Mm. Terribly complicated in some of the execution details, but uh, uh, but some people don't like the idea of summarizing it in a quick way because it's like, well, you've missed all the detail. Right. I think it's important that we get in on a rough page about the main priorities. Mm -hmm. And if I were to summarize them, there's really only three. Mm. One is we need to make more room for nature to come back. I, we need to stop the pushback and, and actually give land back to nature, right? Mm -hmm. This roughly summarizes the 30 by 30 project. Um, yeah. That is the goal to have 30% of land and 30% of ocean waters in the right regions, by the way, protected for nature, um, right. i.e. in this form of park or yeah. in any case, preserved not for takeover by humans. Right, and that's um, by 2030, and which by is 20, this 30, global 30 30. agreement that yep. happened in Montreal. Exactly. And then, um, so that's number one. Mm -hmm. And that will help a lot with biodiversity, and it will help a lot with um, climate too. Um, by the way, the immediate sub-goal there, I kind of want to make the sort of 1% by 2025, which is that there's this key biodiverse areas of the planet mm -hmm. where 90% of the remaining biodiversity is in 1% of the land mass on the land biodiversity, mm -hmm. for example, tiny fraction of the land. Yeah. We need to preserve them like now. <laughs> exactly. Atosa, um, Atosa Sultani said that their, yeah. her orientation is 80% by 2025, 80% of, uh, of the Amazon, because right. we're at 74% right now. Yeah. And basically like, the tipping points around 80. And so we need to not Shift just stop that. the yeah. destruction, but we actually need to start Re broad scale yeah. reforestation. Right. And you start with lands that have been turned into agriculture in the last 25 years that mm -hmm. are close to the other forested areas. And that's where we need to start. So what you're saying is the sub point of 3030 is let's let's make sure the that the key that biodiversity is saved now. We need it now. Just absolutely need to prioritize Critical. it. It's insane that we're not. Right. Yeah. Well, to the back to the money, like there's this great documentary I'm sure I encourage everyone to listen to uh, called Wildlife about the work of Chris mm. and Doug Tompkins, Tompkins yep. who um, actually only spent about a hundred million dollars or something of that order and saved parks all across Chile and Argentina, totaling an area, some huge amount of area. Mm. Um, um, and it's just piddling amounts of money compared with what we're spending on climate mm -hmm. to save the rest of that 1% of the biodiversity, which gives us the seed corn to ensure that we have everything else. It's yeah. like the biobank, nature's biobank. Yeah. So that's so that's the 30 by 30. That's yeah. priority number Pillar one. one. Yep. Priority number two is sustainable food. Mm. We've got to move to sustainable agriculture mm. um, because uh, for multiple reasons, it's like a win, 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 win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sustainable agriculture practice, like where you reduce tilling, use cover crops and things like that, Mm -hmm. It draws down carbon rather than throwing it up. So mm -hmm. it's a massive potential carbon sink. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, we need to do it anyway, because otherwise we're not going to have any, we, we turning all these f agricultural land into dust bowls. I recently read that most of the deforestation is because of agriculture. But if you look, the total area of agriculture is not going up. Mm -hmm. Why? Because uh, at the other end, we're turning a decent fraction of agricultural land every year into dust bowls. <laughs> Mm. So we need it to save the existing agricultural mm. land. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of farmers want to go into sustainable agriculture. It's just because of one reason. They want a farm in 10 years. Mm. <laughs> you know? mm. We're whittling away the soil nutrients by turning them over. And, yeah. so, and then third is biodiversity reason. You know, mm. It brings back biodiversity. Yeah. Um, Wendell Berry quote, you know, no use getting enlightened if you can't keep the topsoil from blowing away. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so. And then the same on fisheries. We've got to do mm. sustainable fishing. Yeah. I mean, and and there we've got a less on an eye because most of us are not at sea most of the time. Yeah. And my God, we're trying our hardest to fuck that up. Excuse totally. my French. Like, yeah. and uh, you know, you can see um, that uh, 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 that this the film. What is it called? Um, sea spiracy. Sea spiracy. Exactly. Yeah. It's a great one for just getting calibrated. Yeah. Just on what you mean by yeah. by 
you know, whatever, dolphin free tuna. Mm, mm-hmm. Nope. <laughs> yeah. And um, just the trawling nets, like just the visuals the of, of just, oh, oh, you know, oh yeah. gosh. Okay. Um, so sustainable foods. Mm. And actually, we know what to do there. Mm. We know how to do sustainable agriculture in a way that it doesn't, uh, that it does reduce carbon and produces as much crops and keeps the, the farm for forever. Mm. Mm. It actually, no one's misaligned there. Mm, mm-hmm. The farmers get better yield. They, mm-hmm. uh, uh, we all get better food. So it's health as well. Mm-hmm. It's, it's certainly environmental health. Um, um, but we do have to do some structural reforms. The American um, Farmers Act doesn't allow, doesn't underwrite the insurance if you use the, the yeah. unless you use the big ag practices, which is not the sustainable ag practices. So the yeah. farmers don't swap because they're this, you know. Yeah, and, and there's higher human and labor EU, inputs and yeah, yeah, less and, fossil fuel inputs, and that requires different cost structures. And there's and, risk and, and there's, there's transition. transition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, so th- it's not a trivial, but right. it's not a. Fu- like, we know what to if do. We, we know what to do. Yeah. And then, um, and by the way, a related point to that, this might be a sub point on the, um, mm. uh, the 30 by 30 is key biodiverse areas. The sub point here is changing diets. Um, mm-hmm. Like we cannot do Western meat consumptions right. and live on this planet and have the rest of life. Right. Just doesn't work. Right. No matter how you say it. In fact, sustainable meat production Mm. takes up far more land, land we just don't have. Totally. So it's better e- 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 yeah. uh, ethically, mm. because who wants the mass, man- mass animal farms? Those are atrocious. I mean, those right. are mass killing facilities, mm. the genocide of our day. Those mm-hmm. are the Auschwitzes of our day. Mm-hmm. So we can't have that. But you can't also have everyone living on beef that takes up large areas right. of land. We've just got too many right. people. We yeah. cannot, we do not have the land for it. So what you're saying is don't go from mass factory farming where we have all the animals stuck in together and go, oh, great. Now we're going to graze them sustainably by littering yeah. them across all yeah. of the land. Not at the rate the West is consuming meat mm. with 8 billion people. Right. Something has to give. Yep. You either have to have mass killing all the humans. Mm. No one likes that solution. Mm. <laughs> you have to mass kill all the rest of life, mm-hmm. or you have to change diets. Right. And frankly, it's pretty obvious <laughs> which one has to go. Right. Um, and we can reclaim meat as more of a treasured meal that is totally. done much more sparingly. It doesn't mean exactly. like, I don't think that it's like everyone go vegan tomorrow. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It, it, it doesn't need to be that big step. It's mm. just a reduction mm-hmm. back to what we used to have just totally two decades ago, in fact. I yeah. mean, when. You know, it's just a couple of th- meat meals a week rather than all the time. And there's mm. lots of meat substitutes that are also going to help us here. Mm. Mm-hmm. But dietary change has to come with it. You can't have China and India and right. other big countries. Right. Luckily, India is mostly vegetarian, thankfully. But like mm. changing to a Western style diet just doesn't add up. I mean, right. it already is wa- laying waste to the Amazon, you know, totally. that is what's called it. Causing it. Totally. And then the third pillar is, is, is the one that everyone knows, mm. which is the um, coal power plants have to go, you know. Mm. And we have to, it's a bit more than that. We have to electrify um, all of our houses. We have to turn our gas ovens into induction ovens. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to, you know, that's an infrastructure, yeah. the cars, the, you know, it's, the, it's electrifying everything and basing it on mm-hmm. um, renewables. Um, so it's, it's so interesting. I, I don't know if you know Justin Winters from One Earth. No. So we interviewed her recently mm-hmm. is on the series and I'll just give a pitch for people to see her interview. You know, she uh, was responsible for, for helping lead the DiCaprio Foundation for yep. many years, One. started One Earth, and they have three pillars of their strategy and they're the exact same three. Oh, good. Right. Which well, is really nice. renewable energy. Yeah the conservation piece, she takes it to also the level of 50 by 50. Mm-hmm. Like it's really about half of the yep, land yep, and yep, oceans yep, yep. by 2050. That's right, per E.O. Wilson's suggestion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then regenerative agriculture. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's right. So, so actually, if we focus on that, I, I'll give a hopeful vision. Mm. Um, when society wants to make something a priority, we can do miraculous things. Mm. COVID, we went from working in offices to working at home, from shaking hands to not shaking hands, mm. from like all these changes overnight to putting up a massive infrastructure to make vaccines, to doing all this stuff yep. in a couple of months. Yep. We, if we have wiped out 70% of life on the earth in four months rather than 40 years, mm. we would be treating this as an emergency. But mm. because it went so slow, was there more 
on them more. Yeah, there were more bugs on the windshield Wasn't there? before. I think, yeah, I think there was. Yeah, I don't really know. Mm. So it's just it's too slow a rate for us to notice. It's mm. like frogs boiling or whatever. I don't like, but look how fast if we declare something emergency. Mm. I mean, I sometimes wake up this vision like if I. You know, became head of a country. You know, I think you could put a country on a warlike footing to change most of the way on these three things I just said mm-hmm. in a year. I mean, I'm not talking a decade. Right. I think you could have even a hundred day plan that would get you halfway there. Right. Like it's not even that hard. The farmers can do that shift. Right. The humans can make that dietary change. Right. The we can preserve more uh, parks. Mm-hmm. We did a big park. I mean, America. We're here in America where. There's a huge generation of parks at one stage. We need to do that again. Mm-hmm. We need the, you know, um, was it Roosevelt who called for the Environment Corps, you know, like the mm-hmm. Peace Corps, you know, mm-hmm. but um, a conservation corps, actually. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah. Uh, like, so, so 30 by 30. Yeah. Sustainable food. And the renewable energy. Renewable energy. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think you can do a lot of that way in, in a year. Yeah. And I... I don't want to exaggerate to make the point, but I mean, if we treated it anything like the priority that we had for COVID, right. for the Ukraine, right. or for um, the financial collapse of recent banks, right. any of that level of priority, mm. we would solve the most of the way in a year. Right. That's my contention. And that's my hope that, mm. you know, if we got a new era of politicians that took this at that level, like warlike footing, and I think humans would understand. The citizens would understand why yeah. we got to do it. Yeah, you know, um, as Gavin Newsom, uh, governor here in California, says, if you don't believe in climate change, just spend a, a few months in California. Mm. <laughs> like we have ex- ridiculous floods, then followed by uh, uh, crazy uh, wildfires. Mm. Um, so, do you feel yeah. like people are understanding and grokking it? I think they're beginning to. They're certainly yeah. in their core can't mm. ignore that mm. things have changed, right. and they speak to their their uncle or grand grandmother mm-hmm. and they hear about what it was like before and like no we never had snow here before or now we do or vice versa right. or you know because it's extreme weather that you first get the climate it's not all in the direction of warm which is obviously mm. some of the counter narrative that there's climate warming isn't happening yeah. is that when it's colder than we expect but totally. like um yeah i think anyone that's with a perception a perceptive eye is going to point out that there's less mm. animals there's war and these things and there's mm. more extreme weather events mm-hmm. um, which is exactly what the scientists told us 50 years ago now right right okay so we have that roadmap in front of us let's talk about tech yeah and okay so you you mentioned satellites let's start there you know like help people who may just hear satellites things orbiting up in space taking pictures maybe but like help us understand the nuance and the profundity of this moment that we're in in terms of what these technologies enable. Yeah. Well, firstly, let me calibrate. I think that most of the things we were just talking about don't need new technology. Right. We don't need a miracle, insert miracle here right. in our strategy. We right. actually know everything we need to do. Um, in fact, in some senses, some of the ag stuff is going back to what we were doing before. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. And conservation, we've been doing that for you know, over a hundred years. I mean, most of our, our ag playbook yeah. is, is removing all of these additives and amendments exactly. to the soil, exactly. getting back to more hand-based tools and, you know, higher labor inputs, yeah. but living in better right relationship with the, the cycle of the land. Well, luckily, AI is going to get rid of most of people's jobs if they're in front of a computer. So now we're going to so give them a job in the, in the field. <laughs> it's going to be a, we went from like 80% of people doing agriculture to yeah. 2% or right. something, and now right. we're going to... Need to take some of them yeah, back, yeah. but luckily we're. Un- <laughs> One of my friends, he he went way down the AI rabbit hole a few months back, and he came out, and, you know, like bleary eyed, and said, you know, my only conclusion is, we all go outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyone that's in front of a computer, <laughs> your job. <laughs> I cue myself in this, right, right? You know, is looking a bit yeah. hairy right now. <laughs> Whereas anyone that's doing plumbing, right. agriculture, right. <laughs> Cleaning. Yeah. These are really hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're in front of a computer. Yeah. Mind yourself, including if you're a computer programmer. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> They're threatening yeah. them too. Yeah. Ironically, yeah. Um, the computer programmers are putting themselves out of a job by doing mm. all this AI work. Anyway, back to the point. Yeah. Um, so we don't need the tech, but the we tech don't need that... the tech, but but it can accelerate. Right. And that's the that's what uh, it's a it's a catalyst. Mm. Right. 
I think the biggest change that would help us in agriculture is the Europe and US changing their agriculture policies. Mm. <laughs> that would be the fastest way to do this. Mm. But in the meantime, we can damn well help with satellite data as an example. So mm. we can tell the crop type and crop yield in each three by three meter box of every farmer's field on every pl- uh, field in mm. every country on the planet. And that, um, it, that and just become possible? or That's like, only become possible in the last couple of years. I How does that, why does that matter? Well, it matters because the farmer needs to know if there's a blight, it, where needs more water, where needs fertilizer, preferably not blanket fertilizer, but just mm. in the area you need mm. um, so that we don't then create runoff that kills lots of life in the, in the rivers mm. um, and reduces their costs. All of these sort of things, so what we call precision agriculture, mm. it's digital agriculture, or now moving towards sort of these sustainable practices, can be monitored from space and aided, increase crop yields, and do mm-hmm. the sustainable ag practices, which holds the carbon in the ground. By the way, gives them an alternative source of income, which is carbon farming. Should They should be paid for pulling that down on mm. the behalf of every, that all the rest of society that's benefiting from them pulling the carbon down, which we all need them to do. Mm. Um, so if I'm managing a farm, I will be able to use satellite information to identify problem areas potentially automatically, yeah. you know, essentially getting alerts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the farmer wake up in the morning, where do I need to work? Well, it's at these fields, these corners, do this, this, so put some fertilizer here, some more water over there. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, and if, these ones are let, need harvesting soon. This is the date you should do it. Um, and so on. All that sort of information right. can be aided. And, these, and you can detect carbon from space? Um, well, we can in the... In, above ground, I so see. that is in the crops themselves mm-hmm. um, or in the trees, um, but we can't in the soil. Right. We can tell the soil moisture level mm. in the top five or 10 centimeters using a passive microwave signal. And we're working on figuring out how we could tell this carbon directly. But what we can do today in terms of carbon in the soil, so we can measure it above ground and the carbon in the soil where most of the carbon is, uh, 80% or more um, on land, is um, um, we can measure the we can look at the practices and monitor are they using tilling or cover crops and other things that we know from other mm. specific research sites are correlated very strongly with carbon mm. so it may increase the error barriers of rather than a direct measurement but it's still um we, an indirect measurement which can help policies and the eu is already doing that they're adding subsidies if the farmers use these sustainable farming practices and we're helping them monitor that to enable their mm. the, those uh, farmers to get those subsidies. So it's happening. Totally. Um, but we can speed this up. Most places on the planet, even in the EU, which has this policy, are not using the satellite data, even though that could, so they're not doing the sustainable pr- practices because they don't know how to monitor that to then to prove it mm. to then get the subsidy. Well, we can help them speed that up, right? right. Um, and back to the um, thing that's driving deforestation to the problem number one mm. that's commodities. The EU has a new piece of legislation that which actually um, um, for the top seven commodities coming into the EU, right? Uh, like palm oil and beef and other things, they have to prove where they came from and that they did not cause further deforestation. Right. Well, we can help that. That sort of thing isn't even possible without satellite data to say, oh, this came from this area right. of this area of Indonesia, and we need. And yes, it didn't did or didn't cause deforestation there. So, so by having kind of a picture of everywhere on the planet over time, you can essentially verify and prove yeah. whether deforestation happened or didn't happen. And, and who so, caused it? And then we can determine what we do about that, right? As a right. society. And, and so our supply chains are going to essentially start to have much more source data and origination data Absolutely. back to their geo coordinates and Absolutely. location. And you can't just do this, you know, oh, no, no, I got it over there. No, 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 I got it over there. So right. that people don't Get to know whether right. it caused deforestation. Deforestation right. free, you know, exactly. palm oil. It's like, exactly. well, I'll prove it. Yeah, prove right. it. And so this is where the satellites, it's not just a solution. It's how do we create those feedback loops, that me- those measurements, that data Precisely. back to right. our systems. Yeah, and both for the people, that the farmers that are trying to improve this mm. and for the regulators that are trying to check mm. that's indeed happening and verify. Yeah. Measurement verification and reporting. I want to get just a little bit further into like, why now? Like why we've had satellites for a long time. You mentioned, you know, put, being able to put a cell phone up in space. And so there's like the miniaturization, but like yeah. what else is happening that's that's creating this now effect? Well, the main thing is exactly that. It's, it's miniaturization. Mm. 
Uh, that's led to about a thousand fold increase in cost performance of satellites over the last five to 10 years, which is a big change for a thousand industry. fold decrease in cost over yeah, the last basically. decade. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that is akin to the mainframe to desktop um, mm. computer uh, revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not claiming it's going to have the same degree sure. of effect, but it's certainly unleashing a lot of. Mm. greenfield opportunities for doing satellites in different ways that give us different things. And the main upshot yep. is more data. <laughs> right. Um, what we're having is two main kinds of satellites. The communication satellites, that's like Starlink, OneWeb, mm. that enabling rural places like where we're sitting to have access to the internet that w- without having to put cables everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing is Earth observation data that helps us understand what's going on mm. around the planet. So it's even though we can talk about all the space geekery, including the rockets, and they've decreased in cost mm. about 4x over the last 5 to 10 years. Wow. So the dominant factor is the satellites mm. increase, but the, the rocket piece has helped as well. Mm-hmm. So there's compounding effect. Um, but the upshot is a data upshot. It's, yep. And it's all about the Earth and the Earth's economy and mm. how we can help advance the Earth's economy mm. um, and speed up the transition, digital transition and sustainability transition. Right. And and even though a lot of people now understand AI through the lens of chat GPT, you know, there has been a machine learning renaissance or revolution that precedes chat GPT for some time. And the currency, the oil that it runs on is data. Absolutely. Right. So, so help us understand how those two worlds converge. Uh, it's a great question. And, and, um, Area the, the, yeah. Um, well, as the economist put it, and you're sort of saying, uh, data is the new oil. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully, it's not as dirty as oil, right. but it's the fuel for all these digital transformations, sustainability transformations, the global economy, which is a multi-trillion-dollar shift mm. um, in each case. Um, so, uh, yeah, y- you don't have anything useful in AI until you train it on data. Mm. It is literally zero value before it has data because you have n- nothing. No outputs unless you train it on data. So it's all about the training data. You will notice that Google open sources a lot of their AI through TensorFlow and other things. They don't open source much of their data. Mm. There's a reason. Mm. <laughs> One is their proprietary asset that they consider their moat. And the other is, is getting more commoditized. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, so yeah. yeah, we've got, a, so most of the chat GPT things are trained, the large language models are trained on the, uh, the corpus of the text on the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, they haven't really been trained much on satellite data yet. Yep. But the but we've had computer vision for some while doing uh, um, object detection. There's a tree, there's a house, there's a car, there's mm-hmm. a plane. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we can count things, and that's useful. Mm-hmm. But we're definitely going to go, um, for example, we did a bit of work um, in Turkey and Ukraine doing building damage assessments mm-hmm. uh, for the uh, for the earthquake there and for the UN, respectively, to help um, the UN get displaced people back into their homes in Ukraine. Um, and that was because of the scale of the, each of those cases. Mm-hmm. We wanted to use AI to mm-hmm. automatically detect the building damage because there's just mm-hmm. too many to do manually. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we're going to an interface that looks closer to ChatGPT. Oh, just tell me what happened in Turkey today. Mm. Oh, there was an earthquake. Here's where, when, uh, here's how it relates to previous earthquakes. And oh, I see you from your IP. You're here. Um, the nearest place that needs help is there. This is where the the people are mainly in this stadium. They need blankets and medicine. Oh, and here's the local FEMA for your area where you can give donations. You know, mm. um, so you know you're going to have this sort of queryable interface to wow. have semantic understanding of what's going on wow. without having to have a PhD in geospatial uh, right. satellite data, basically. Right. Fascinating. Okay. And now let's talk about Web3 then. Where does that fit into all this? Well, I think that Web3 fits in. I mean, so I'm not a, a huge um, like advocate of Web3 generally. I mean, it's, I'm not like, pro or against as much as I'm skeptical about all the benefits that are, are proselytized about it. Mm. Um, a lot of pyramid schemes and other danger zones as far as I'm saying. But as with all technology, there's good and bad stuff. And, and I think that... Um, Smart contracts can be one of the most amazing things to help us with carbon markets. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, mm-hmm. uh, stepping back one, one of the ways to accelerate are all of these three major pillars that we spoke about before mm-hmm. um, is to put a price on what we're using in terms of carbon and nature, mm-hmm. both of those things. Mm-hmm. Put a price on it, you need to measure it. 
uh, you measure it systematically and so on. And you need to create an exchange uh, between the people that want to buy it, mm -hmm. like a Microsoft or a country or, you know, a big country, company or com com country, and the people that want to sell theirs in exchange for just keeping what they want. Mm -hmm. So you know, the example I often give is this Microsoft and indigenous people in somewhere in the Amazon. And those indigenous people don't want to clear the land for the farmer that's saying, I'll give you 50 bucks an acre mm -hmm. per year to grow palm oil or put cattle on it, mm -hmm. which is their trade right now. And the person just wants to send their kid to school or buy food or basic things. And they don't have any money source um, in a lot of these places. And there's an economic incentive mm -hmm. to cut down the trees, to put the farm there that we are paying for in the West mm -hmm. by being, buying beef burgers and other things, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're driving that demand. Mm -hmm. But it's small economics <laughs> on each totally. acre. It's crazily small. Totally. But no one's willing to keep, pay them to keep the trees. But everyone benefits if they just keep the trees. <laughs> right. So if you could just tip the balance, so what would that take? You know, order 100 bucks an acre or a hectare, um, mm. similar, just in order of magnitude terms, mm -hmm. um, you could tip the balance the other way. Well, that turns out to be roughly the sort of amount or a little bit less than the CO2 is worth mm. from just keeping the trees there. Mm -hmm. If we could only figure that mechanics, yep. and that requires... Yeah, it's, it's far thing. more, really. But it's yeah. far more, far more. Right. But even at today's sort today's of carbon, you could get to that that right. sort of level. Right. And if you factor in biodiversity in these places, it should exactly. be worth much, much more. But we haven't right. figured out how to measure that. And or no, a, an entire lessons. intact ecosystem that controls the hydrological cycle of the planet and what totally, the <laughs> totally. Right. But but if since the economic and, and by the right, way, right, if someone right. wants to put a mine there and that's worth a million dollars, right. this ain't going to help. But right. you know. It's going to help with a lot of the cases, a lot of the time, if yeah. you even give them a hundred bucks an acre to mm. keep the trees. Yeah. And the exchange goes something like this. Microsoft says, I want to buy certified carbon credits mm. so that I can say at the end of the year, mm -hmm. I'm net zero carbon offsetting all my execs flying around the planet. Mm -hmm. I'm an indigenous person. I want to send my kid to school. I, mm. And somebody's offered me some little bit of money to clear the forest and make agriculture. But somebody mm. else has just offered me slightly more than that mm -hmm. <laughs> to keep the forest there. Yeah. Just to, and all I have to do is agree not to cut down the trees. Yeah, great. I'll make that exchange. The satellite data verifies it for both parties that mm. they don't cut it down. That this is how much carbon is they can Microsoft mm. can knock off their yeah. um, balance sheet to the, to get to carbon neutrality. Yeah, uh, the smart contract links it with together. Yeah, um, there's that's what I see coming together, and that. Mm. We are on the precipice, mm. <laughs> and that's when you go, don't allow billions, you allow trillions mm. to flood to this. Look, I'm not into capitalism as the be-all, end-all of life. In fact, I think there's serious fundamental flaws. But we're not going to suddenly change the fundamentals of capitalism overnight. Yeah. But with this judo move to value nature, mm -hmm. we can add that on <laughs> as a module onto capitalism and very quickly transition trillions mm. to the areas of focus, which is the areas that we need, the conservation, mm -hmm. the sustainable agriculture, because we could do the same in agriculture for carbon farming, mm -hmm. as the forestry example I was just doing. Mm -hmm. And then you, you've solved a lot of the problem right there. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's shifting, uh, sh you know, it's shifting incentives. Yeah, and I mean, we have such, so much gratitude to pay to the indigenous people especially who've been protecting these lands i mean like they don't want to cut down the forest and i don't want to speak for them but the proof is that the forests are still standing yeah. like there has been ample opportunity for destruction of these habitats and they've chosen as a broad statement to maintain ecosystems much more intact than the rest of the world has chosen right so when we're talking about you know small amounts of money to make sure that that continues and that the tide, which is unfortunately towards deforestation right now, reverses. Yeah. So instead of 76% of the Amazon, you know, still being intact, that we get mm -hmm. back up above 80. Um, yeah, it just makes so much sense that we would use currency that everyone's yeah. using, these symbolic forms of value exchange, like without necessarily saying, oh, no, that's too close to financialization of nature or yeah. the destruction of, well, of capitalism and to find a way to make right. this work. Well, absolutely. And, and, and you're right. And a lot of biodiversity is on indigenous people's land, mm -hmm. um, such as it is, which is greatly diminished. But, um, and 
look, I, I appreciate a lot of conservationists thrust when they're like, don't financialize nature. This mm-hmm. is how we went wrong in the first place. Yeah. So let's just address that front on. I, yep. I, I get that. I feel that myself. Totally. But we are whittling away nature at such a rate. This is, mm-hmm. you know, 70 years percent of the last 40 years. Mm-hmm. Insane. Mm-hmm. We have to change that really fast. Mm-hmm. The world today runs on capitalism mm-hmm. everywhere from China to the US, you know, the one, the commonality is capital. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but that ain't changing overnight. Mm-hmm. We may need to come up with some other plan in some longer term, but for now we have to, that, that would take decades. Mm-hmm. We haven't got decades. Yep. We've got singles of years at best. Mm-hmm. Really, we've got a debt of time already, you know? Yep. Yep. So um, this is the way that I think we get, it's a ban, uh, band-aid yep. in the sense of the arc of history. Yeah. But it's a band-aid we've got to do. Yeah. Yeah. If the patient comes to the hospital, you know, just got hit by a car and has all these broken bones and, you know, it's like you can't just say, well, well, we don't want to, you know, put you under for surgery because we don't like the anesthesia. Like, it's like you have to take some dramatic action to first save the patient and and allow the healing process to happen. And I guess like, the way I'm interp- the way I'm trying to feel it now is like the the gravity and the weight I feel of the like existential dread of anything that that does feel like it's a it's like a risks commodifying or financializing mm-hmm. nature. It's like to take that as the responsibility to really dive into the nuance of the implementation of these systems and to take it with a very serious responsibility, knowing that we're yes. in also very dangerous yeah. territory to start saying that that piece of land is worth x to this indigenous community and you know because as soon as we do that we know it it is very dangerous because it it can kind of also mean the opposite which is that rather than the intrinsic value of nature being recognized we're saying oh well no it's only good because it's ten thousand dollars a hectare but that means if someone's willing to pay ten thousand and one then okay cut it down Right. Yeah. Like we're, we're cr- constructing ridiculous. a system that, that can allow for that when we bring things into the numeric form, which is also why we can't isolate it only to the finance. You know, we yeah. have to think about the policy. We have to think about the culture. We have to think about the social norms. Yeah, no, no question. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I really feel like the other challenge here is that, well, we've we've had this asymmetric exploitation Really, it should be the developed world. It should be the exploited world, right? Mm. I mean, massively exploited by domineering countries, mm. and we still ha- are running on an a, yep. a, an economic system that is economic Im- imperialist system. Yep. yep. And so, if I was an indigenous person in, in a forest in the Amazon, mm. I would damn well would be skeptical. Oh, right, uh, mm-hmm. here's white man turning up again. Mm-hmm. The next fix, aha, uh-huh. we've mm-hmm. seen that rodeo, totally. and I'm not going there. I can only imagine the skepticism to this sort of idea. Mm. And yet I do think there's a way through here Mm -hmm. that, as you say, with with careful nuance thinking about, Mm. hey, um, let's be sure that no matter if there's any upside to that carbon credit, it doesn't just go to Microsoft to get shared in a way that really cements all people being getting value um, out of that rather than just the capitalists that you know, are the only ones that get value out of accretive benefits generally in our totally. present economic system. By doing some of those things, I think you can make headway. But, you know, that, yep. that yeah, it's, I, it's the, I definitely get the caution. Mm. I, it's a bit like the geoengineering, like, do mm. we do it? Do we not? When, mm. when it gives us this sense that we, oh, we can just pollute everywhere slash mm. not focus on mitigating the problem in the first place. We just mm. fix it by putting up shades or whatever. Ah, but at this point, mm in these crises to not think about these tools when we have so you were talking about you know um um tipping points we don't know where we're out on those mm-hmm. we cannot risk wasting away another 20 percent mm. on top of that 70 percent of biodiversity and risk that mm. we cannot and that that course correction has to happen in the next year or two mm. otherwise we're hosed 
Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, when you, it's, you talk about the nuance and the speculative nature of like if Microsoft buys credit and then it's worth something, I think that's one distinction that's emerging, which is like the resaleability mm. and where does that benefit go? go. Yeah. You know, like what, what is financial it. speculation versus, you know, more about offsetting and retiring those credits? I think there's yes. there's big distinctions and, and, yeah. and things there. There's big distinctions around are we building ecosystem service markets that are more supply led? or demand led, you know, is it, uh, is it yeah. really in service to the land stewards and the foresters and the farmers versus the, the buyers, the Microsofts or the, yeah. the speculators and uh, Gregory Landway who did yeah. an interview, you know, he, he articulated that really well. Yeah. And, and then there's one other distinction I was going to say, which is the, um, the, the governance, you know, it's like ultimately mm -hmm. who gets to decide mm -hmm. which types of credits are being Whoa, sourced from the land and yeah. the territory. I think this is an area where I'm maybe a bit less skeptical and more hopeful about Web3, which is, I think that what crypto brings in terms of being able to unleash just a multitude of governance experiments mm -hmm. and restructure governance. There's so much made of the financialization of what crypto offers, but I do think governance is going to be one of the big frontiers. No, absolutely. And we've got to sort that it gives us a lot of option space to get it right. Mm. Um, and I think there's a lot of willingness where there's a tweaks to what we're normally used to, mm -hmm. to, to accept that. We've got to make changes pretty quick. Now, I mean, I think that the, the challenge here, there's a few challenges to this sort of vision of, of proper carbon accounting. Mm. Um, one is that we don't have good registries of, of who owns what in order to do this. And we have a good measurement of the carbon, but if somebody right. says, I'm going to protect the forest, do you know that they're the person that has sort of authorized to do that? Slash, mm. know that it's not going to, somebody else going to come along and chop mm -hmm. it down. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the faculties and the legal authority to protect it. Um, um, and a second one is all those governance and financial nuances to ensure that we get it right, mm -hmm. you know, but I think Web3 can really help with that yeah. um, and stitch the pieces together uh, without just benefiting the middleman. I think the bigger challenge is going to be how we append the value of nature into that because mm -hmm. no one has yet agreed on what we are measuring. There was the ton of carbon equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, there's ideas in that realm and there's some good ideas, but we need some sort of international common understanding of what that's going to be. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we don't know how exactly how to measure it either. Mm -hmm. um, but we know it's very valuable. In fact, you know, to our earlier conversation, it's probably much more valuable than the carbon piece. Yep. <laughs> right now, carbon is a good proxy to get going mm. because biodiversity is lots of carbon. Mm -hmm. It's not ideal. It really isn't because it doesn't convey the complexity of the ecosystems right. or the biodiversity or anything else. Right. But it does get us along the way and it's something we can measure today and to the time of urgency there's no way yeah. that we can get to that agreed upon measurement and how we measure it in the relevant time frame yeah. so let's uh, let's we're going to append carbon to capitalism and we're going to append biodiversity to carbon for a little bit yeah. <laughs> until we figure this stuff out yeah i guess the counter the counter argument i i, I resonate with what you're saying I, and I think the counter argument that I hear that I'm I'm still sitting with is like that the the thinking that got us here won't get us out of this mess, or mm -hmm. that if we if we start with urgency, that maybe that's not the medicine. That it's really about slowing down. And I try to internalize the the lessons of that kind of thrust of thinking, and I still end up back in yeah. <laughs> wanting to use these tools to yeah. measure nature, to provide better incentives and feedback loops and mechanisms so that we can use our financial markets in service to life. Yeah, mm. yeah, no doubt. I mean, look, the long term solution is much more in education than it is in mm. um, adding carbon to the economy. Um, it's much more in cultural evolution. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just think humanity has to f have a suite of tools for different right. timescales. Yeah. So we're, we're doing the best we can yeah. <laughs> as a species to evolve. And I just think these technology can help us do that Band-Aid, mm. which is a technology, mm. a little technology to help us get there, you know, mm. like uh, quicker. Is it ideal? No. Um, mm. But is it better than not? Absolutely. And so it's, look, it's not perfect, but yeah. we're in a messy place. I let, yeah, I, I just... And by sort of, I think back to the point about the perspective here 
the planetary perspective, mm. life is so rare. Mm. We cannot afford to be whittling away our biodiversity or our, our numbers to something that we don't know how to replace. It's, right. Earth is irreplaceable. Mm. And if a Band-Aid saves those key biodiverse areas from further encroachment mm. by, yes, okay, not imperfect, imperfectly valuing nature and imperfectly valuing carbon and these things and mm. sticking it on the side of capitalism, mm. ugly as it is, I would take it any day. We, we cannot lose the life on our Earth. I agree that urgency is part of what's caused mm. a lot of our challenges. It's, but I think it's more the growth mindset mm. and growth at all costs and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. our, our, economy is butting up against planetary boundaries mm -hmm. and by the way the planet's going to win but how long are we going to take before we notice that mm -hmm. and you know so i think we've got to do the best job we can turning a right hand corner <laughs> pretty quickly mm -hmm. to go from 70 percent you know ecocide in in 40 years to almost zero in a couple of years you know mm -hmm. we've got to and then give it back um to the 30 by 30 objective and that's not not simple but we know what we need to do and we have the tools that and can enable it today so i'm i'm actually optimistic about that despite everything well marshall thanks for your time no it's lovely to be here well i hope you enjoyed that conversation with will it's such a punch in the stomach to hear that stat about 70 percent ecocide in just 40 years I feel like Will offered some important frames in that discussion around focusing on ecocide rather than climate, how he called it the exploited world rather than the developing world, and how he believes that policy is still more important than technology in this moment we're in in addressing the ecological crisis. I also think it's noteworthy how Will appreciates the risks around financializing or commodifying nature, but still believes that we must, quote, put a Band-Aid on capitalism because the current situation is so dire and life is so precious in this universe. To learn more, go to planet.com. You might also want to check out the conversations we had with Robbie Shingler, co-founder of Planet Labs, as well as Tara O'Shea, who leads forests and land use at Planet Labs. Links are in the show notes. All of these discussions and more can be found at maearth.com. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, share, subscribe, join our community discord. Let us know what you think. I'll see you on the next one.